Annika Nilsson and Sarah Knell, you are part of a research team here at the Stockholm Environment Institute and Stockholm Resilience Centre, where you have looked at the resilience of the Arctic region. Could you tell us a little bit more about this project? Well, the background is really that change in the Arctic is extremely rapid. The, the extremely rapid decline of the sea ice caught many people by surprise, and the need to uh, respond and to find ways towards adaptation really made the Arctic Council highlight the need for adaptation, but also in that context the need to understand the resilience of the region. And that was two years ago at the ministerial meeting in Nuuk, where the whole process of this Arctic Resilience Report started. And it's a Swedish chairmanship priority, and Sweden of course has had the chairmanship of the Arctic Council during the past two years. And now you published, uh, well, so far, an interim report. Yes. What are the key messages? We've distilled out seven key messages, actually, and I th- but that is rather a long list to go through. I want to just pick out a couple of really important ones. As Annika said, we're facing very rapid changes, not just in the biophysical environment, but also in a whole range of social and, and economic changes in the region, too. Um, and it's Our main focus has been on trying to understand the implications of the interactions of these changes and what they mean for the peoples who live in the Arctic region. A really big message for us, too, is the fact that we're looking at this issue from two ends. Global changes play out in the local region in the Arctic. Obviously, global change affects everybody around the world, but the changes that we see in the Arctic as a result, particularly of climate change, global warming, are really sharp, really radical, and are bringing around some irreversible changes to ecosystems, and probably the communities that depend on those ecosystems too. And then from the other side, local changes in the Arctic also have global consequences through the global economy. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to understand better the two ends of the same problem Mm -hmm. as they play out in the Arctic. Annika, I mean, there are obviously several large-scale projects concerning the Arctic region. What makes this project and indeed this report a bit more unique? Uh, the Arctic Council has been really successful in bringing out assessments about specific aspects of Arctic change, everything from climate change to pollution issues to human development in the region. Most of the time those have been treating the, the, the natural world and the social world mm. uh, fairly separately. What we try to do is to look at the interlinkages between the, the, the biophysical systems and the social systems. And what we see so much, exactly what Sarah says, the interaction between them, because it could actually be that interaction that puts that extra pressure on not being able to cope and adapt. And one of the things we need to understand is not just the drivers of change, such as climate change or industrialization, we also need to understand how the capacity for adaptation is, mm. has been eroded mm. or could be strengthened, which of course is, is leads to the issue of discussing what are the policy implications mm. of, of understanding these kinds of processes. Mm. And finally, Sarah, what are the next steps of this project? The big challenge for us in the next step is to bring together all the really diverse bits of information that we've managed to map out in this first phase. One thing that's become really clear is just how diverse the different knowledge inputs are to the process, including the traditional knowledges and the traditional communities that we've been engaging with in the process. So the big ask by 2015 is that we bring this all together. It will involve a lot more dialogue with many different kinds of stakeholders, Mm. and we'll try to bridge the scales and bridge the knowledge across disciplines as well.